Today, we're talking about evictions. It's taken me four months to remove somebody from a property because I did not know the law. We're going to talk about what you need to know about eviction law, at least in Texas, but a lot of it's similar in other states. Um, how long it should actually take you if you do it right? What are the do's? What are the don'ts? Um, if you don't do it yourself, how much it might cost you to use a lawyer? All of it. Everything from my long, tumultuous experience with my first eviction ever. But I won eventually, so it's good news. So without further ado, uh, let's talk evictions. We'll jump right into it. All right, welcome back, Airbnb family. So yes, November 3rd, I 4th, November 4th, I put a notice on a door for them to vacate a property for delinquency, non-payment. Now there's two types of evictions. There's going to be your delinquency and then your non-delinquency, which non-delinquency would be like a violations of some terms of the contract, like the lease agreement. So those are your two types. Now there's a common misconception about evictions in our world, the world of rental arbitrage, where you have a lease and then you're the leaseholder and then somebody else is an occupant. A lot of times people would argue that you are roommates with the person you're trying to evict, which means you can't legally evict them. Well, let's clear that up. If somebody has an agreement to pay you to stay somewhere or has some other agreement where, you know, in exchange for other, like, so like if somebody works for you um, in exchange for services or payment or something, they're staying at this property, you have a landlord tenant relationship. And if you have a landlord tenant relationship, you can proceed with an eviction. But in Texas, at least, you cannot evict somebody unless you're the owner of the property. But that's not even a big deal because if you think about it, a lot of these properties uh, that we, we stay at, we live at, have property management companies. Those are called third-party fee-based property management companies. They have permission from the owners to evict people on behalf of the owner. This is already something they have permission for. And that's all you need as well, is you just need permission to conduct an eviction on behalf of the owner of the property. That's it. So you can go to your landlord or you can go to the property management company for the building that you've already negotiated with before and state that in the case that you need to remove somebody, and conduct an eviction, you'd like to have permission to do so. And it's super simple. You get like this written permission slip and you, you, know, you move forward. So this is something that I did not know. And this was at the heart of my mistake when I went through the eviction process. So I submitted this notice to vacate. I put it on the inside of the door of the apartment, which is what you have to do. Um, there's a couple other ways you can, you know, you, you know, submit it. Um, and for ease, I'm going to give you a copy of a blank version of a notice to vacate. I'm going to leave it in like the description so that way you can have a link to one for your own reference. Your notice to vacate needs to be airtight and legal. You have to give somebody at least three days notice to vacate when they're delinquent on payment. You have to list, um, you know, basically name of the person you're evicting, person to who, who's doing the evicting, date, application or date the notice was given, how it was given. You have to fill out this whole thing nice and perfect and then leave it. After that three days, on the fourth day, you can uh, conduct what's called an eviction petition online, file to do that, go to court and everything. So I was the plaintiff, which was what was incorrect about my case. When I showed up, um, I did not show up with a copy of the lease. I showed up with my notice to vacate and things like that. I showed up with proof that he's paid me before, like in my phone, but not on, on paper. And then the defendant showed up and claimed that he was like my roommate essentially and that I didn't have right to evict him, that only the property management could actually do the evicting. Um, I didn't have a copy of my lease, so I, can't pr I couldn't prove that he wasn't on the lease itself. And he lied and said that we didn't have a payment agreement. So that caused my court uh, case to be um, reset. He did not dismiss it uh, because the defendant was there. So... Um, since the defendant was there to defend himself and we couldn't come to like some sort of like, this is legitimate. He gave me my, the, since it was my first time doing an eviction, he gave me a week and reset it. So after that, I got an attorney. The attorney did what's called an amended petition where instead of me being the sole plaintiff, he added the building owner as an added party. Well, this is where he went wrong. He was technically supposed to add the building owner as the plaintiff, and then I would be the added party. So when he amended the petition, which allows him to rewrite the petition, he should have just wrote, wrote it differently. So when we show up for our next court case, the defendant did not show up. And since the defendant did not show up to defend himself, the judge goes through the paperwork just nice and thorough and makes sure everything is legit before he you know, stamps his approval. But that was where the problem was. If the defendant actually showed up again, 
we, we would have had like this back and forth talk and then the judge would have saw the paperwork in specific pieces that he asked for and saw that it was legit and he would have awarded us. If the defendant does not show up, it's actually harder. Okay. So make sure your paperwork is in order and proper in case the defendant does not show up for a trial. So they dismissed the case. That was no fun. So what we had to do is we had to appeal and take it to county court. Now, when we take it to county court, even if you have an attorney, you have to show up. So I had to show up. And what was great about this, though, is we would normally appeal and say, well, the paperwork is correct enough, right? There was no reason for it to get dismissed over this little nuance. We should still be able to proceed with the eviction because of the nature of it. You know, he had his argument and he was going to even call me as a witness, um, et cetera. So it would have been a little bit more of a tedious task. But since my attorney sent, um, you know, first class mail stating, you know, we're, you're filing the, um, we're filing an appeal. This is the information. And we tried to correspond with the defendant and the defendant did not respond. Um, and then the defendant did not show up for the appeal date. Um, we were able to file what's called a, a notice for default judgment. Just we're going to get the judgment by default. And so we won nice and easy because the defendant did not show up. Fun. Okay. So now we finally have our eviction case one. And so this took what this would have taken in a normal vacuum. Three days, notice to vacate. Fourth day, file your petition. It takes two weeks to get a court case usually. And then... Um, from there, there's a five day appeal window. In our case, since we'd lost the court case, um, a month had already gone by and then the reset was set for another two and two and a half weeks out. And then we won. And then we have five days from that one for another appeal process. So every, every time that there's a judgment, there's a five day appeal window. Since we won after this five day appeal window, we can then file for the writ of possession. And that's when the judge sends a constable to leave a writ of possession on the door. Now that has to stay there 24 hours before we can call and ask for a constable to remove the person from the property and they could be available to do so within a couple of days. It could take a week or so. So realistically, if you do it without losing and, and, and appealing, and if you do it in one smooth motion, it should take you about 30 to 40 days to get a constable at the door to remove somebody. So with that said, if you do it on your own and you do it right, you can do it for like less than 500 bucks because you're going to have to pay for your, um, your eviction petition you're going to have to pay for the constable to come out, stuff like that. You're going to have to pay then also for the locks to get changed while the constable is there and for a mover to remove the property. If the defendant is not willing to remove his property himself, you're going to have to hire a mover to curb everything. And then the defendant has seven to 10 days to remove his property from the curb before it can be thrown away. And that's just the law. Now, if the defendant leaves and abandons the property before the constable comes for this final time, you still have to remove any leftover property and curb it. Um, and if he leaves a pet, you have to file a report because abandoning a pet is neglect and that's actually illegal. And then you have to take that animal somewhere safe, like an animal shelter and give the owner's information over. It's because you cannot leave an animal on the street outside for seven to 10 days. That's also animal cruelty. So don't do that. So this is the, this is the, what you should do. Okay. Now let's talk about what you should not do. There are things called self-help, um, which is where you shut the electricity off or remove the internet or something like that. You cannot do that. Um, anything that you provide a tenant in exchange for their rents, you have to continue to provide throughout the stay. This includes a parking spot, anything. You cannot remove the tenant's property. You cannot withhold their property for payment. You cannot, that's theft. Um, you cannot try to forcibly remove the tenant from the property. Um, these are all self-helps that you can't do. You can't remove the front door, so that way they're unable to lock the door. These are things that you cannot do also. So all self-help practices you should not do. Uh, it's also advised that you don't communicate with the defendant because if you say anything sideways, they can try to take it to court and get like a restraining order against you. And this could delay the eviction process. There's also a couple other things that they could do to delay the eviction process, but we're not going to talk about it here because I'd hate for a defendant to get this video and get extra ammo. That'd be super stupid of me to give you there. But there are just things that you want to avoid from happening. Um, do not let a tenant pay you for rent, um, which means never allow a tenant to deposit rents into your bank account. Do not give them some sort of um, method to pay like that because if they drop a check in your account and say, hey, I already paid him rent. There's proof in his account. There's proof that my check was cashed. Um, they could use that as like... Um, a reason to state that your notice of delinquency is, is no longer valid. So those are some things that you do not do. Do not give them the out like that. Never take partial payment for rent. 
Um, also, if you put in the notice to vacate that, um, you know, that they were delinquent, but it wasn't just the rent that they're getting thrown out for, but you put uh, like another contractual breach in there. Uh, that way, if you do get them to pay you rent, you can still move forward with the eviction if you, in the notice to vacate, leave in the language a certain way. So you can do a little homework on that on how you want to actually do the language of your notice to vacate to still give you the ability to collect the rents and kick the person out because um, you should be able to. So um, the plot twist, like the big plot twist for this whole thing, aside from the fact that I lost and then won, was that this was not an Airbnb guest. This was actually not even a short-term rental customer. So my company, Media Press, um, provides housing for sales representatives when they relocate from different cities. And this was a guy from Chicago staying in Fort Worth. And we actually cut his contract and terminated it in October. But we told him that we'll allow him to still pay his, his weekly rent while he figures his life out, even though he wasn't working for the company. Well, no good deed goes unpunished. And so he stopped paying his rent and then we tried to evict him. So November 3rd was when I gave him his notice and then I had to go to Thailand because I had my trip. And he said that he was getting a lease somewhere else already, so it wasn't a big deal. Um, and that he was going to get out. And he kind of convinced me to not be aggressive in my eviction process. So another thing is don't believe people right? People will lie to you, especially when it comes to like living and squatting in your home. So with that said, be aggressive with your eviction process. Be a little bit heartless. Unfortunately, um, people will take advantage of you just for the sake of buying time and writing on your dime. Um, do not communicate with the guest. Do not allow them to make you um, like the emotional in any way. So that way they can't like start to use that against you in court. Um, don't do anything in the self-help category. Um, but just do a little bit more homework about tenant landlord relationships and in advance, get permission from your buildings to conduct evictions if you ever need it. Now, the point here though is, um, the reason why I told you is that it wasn't an Airbnb guest is because I still haven't had this issue with any Airbnb guests. It's been five years now almost that I've been an Airbnb host and I've never had to go through this process of forcibly removing somebody. It's always been handled prior to having to do an eviction. Now in Texas, people have established tenancy in as short as a week. I don't know how. It could be that maybe there was a lease agreement or some sort of written agreement that started and because they had executed this agreement um, that that's what awarded them tenancy. Normally, it's like four weeks or more that you need to stay somewhere before you become a tenant. But look at your local laws about that and just be prepared for that too if you want to avoid it. Another thing that I do to help prevent people from proving tenancy is I don't give my guest keys to the mailbox. I don't let them receive mail at the property. If somebody puts a utility in their name or if they receive mail at the property, that's a way to prove tenancy at a spot. And I don't allow people to do things that would establish tenancy. That's something that I've always done right from the beginning. And maybe that's why I've never had this issue is because I've also made it a little bit harder for people to become tenants. So uh, take all that for what it is. Um, put it in your back pocket as an Airbnb host and keep it just in case you need it. If you have any questions about this, leave it in the comments. If you have a specific situation going through with a person not leaving, um, also feel free to ask away. I'm here for you guys. It's good to be back doing videos again. Um, and on a similar note, um, don't murder people. I don't know if you saw in the news, but uh, BBC just did a report on this too. Um, Thank you to one of my friends who sent it. Let's see who, oh, um, a guy from my high school, actually Michael O'Keefe, um, which uh, I actually Michael is somebody that everybody in my high school looked up to because his family was like, like real estate. They were really good at what they did. Um, and they had this booming real estate company. And I think he got like a factory in China from his grandfather when he turned 18. So family is doing pretty well. So me and my poverty on welfare, I'm of course, looking up at the O'Keefe family at like, how can I do well for my life? And um, it's fun. We're friends. And I think we're more uh, financially equal now, I think. Um, I don't own a factory in China, though. So Mike, in the comments, what are you doing with that factory in China? We would like to know. Um, but anyway, he's the one who said the article. Um, the BBC reported on it. A guy did not pay his rent to an Airbnb host for like three days. It was like 210 American dollars that the guy owed and the host attacked him. The host and the host's friend attacked this guy um, and killed the man. Um, and now the claim was he didn't think he was going to kill the guy by getting physical with him. And so now he's got like a manslaughter charge. So that's not going to be good for Airbnb as a brand. Um, but don't do that. Um, don't get violent and kill people, please. So thank you for watching Airbnb Automated. Thanks for sticking around. I'll see you on the other side.